there you go. RTX 4090 unboxing. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we are taking our first look at NVIDIA's new GeForce 40 series with the current flagship model, the GeForce RTX 4090. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, it's a chunky graphics card. You're probably also aware that it has a fairly disappointing asking price as NVIDIA did provide all the pricing information in their keynote four weeks ago now. But if you haven't heard the bad news, pricing does start at $1,600 US. So there's a lot to talk about here, but before we do, let's quickly touch on the specifications and then take a look at the Founders Edition model. And then of course we will get into those blue bar graphs. The RTX 4090 is based on the AD102 silicon, which measures 608.4 millimeters squared. So it is 3% smaller than that of GA102 used by the GeForce 3080 and 3090 series. But of course, NVIDIA has moved from the Samsung 8N process with Ampere to TSMC's 4N process for Ada Lovelace. And quite incredibly, this has seen the transistor count increase by 170% from 28.3 billion to an insane 76.3 billion. When compared to the RTX 3090 Ti, there's 52% more streaming multiprocessors, CUDA cores, tensor cores, RT cores, and texture units. The ROP count has increased by 57% and the boost clock has been wound up by 35%. That said, the same 21 gigabits per second GDDR6X memory has been used and there's still 24 gigabytes of the stuff on a 384 bit wide memory bus. And this results in the same 1008 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. And Nvidia is still using the PCI Express 4.0 times 16 interface. Now, NVIDIA claims a total graphics power rating of 450 watts for the RTX 4090, and that's the same rating that was given to the 3090 Ti, though the maximum GPU temperature has been slightly downgraded from 93 degrees to 90 degrees. The minimum power supply requirement is 850 watts, and as luck would have it, that's what I'll be using for all of my testing. Now, in terms of design, the Founders Edition 4090 looks very similar to the 3090, though there are some fairly significant changes. The most notable of which is the width. On paper, NVIDIA claims a triple slot form factor for both models, which is accurate, but whereas the 3090 is 52 millimeters wide, the 4090 is 17% wider at 61 millimeters, though despite that rather large increase, both models weigh about the same amount. And at 2,190 grams, the 4090 is less than a percent heavier than the 3090. So that's surprising, but what's not surprising is the absence of the NVLink connector, which NVIDIA has now killed off and will instead just use the PCIe 4.0 bus. The only other major change here is the 16 pin power input, which has been upgraded to the PCIe 5.0 spec, otherwise known as the super catchy 12V HPWR power connector. A single PCIe 5.0 connector can deliver up to 600 watts, and previously that would require four eight pin power connectors. However, you won't need a new PCIe 5.0 compliant power supply as RTX 4090s do come with a four times eight pin to single 16 pin adapter, similar to the times three eight pin to 16 pin model supplied with the 3090 Ti's. I should also note that it was falsely reported that the 12V HPWR power connector could only survive 30 cycles, so 30 connects and disconnects, but that's not the case and connector longevity will be similar to what we saw with the eight pin connectors. So that is to say you're basically never going to wear one out. Now, apart from the increase in cores, the inclusion of fourth generation tensor cores and third generation RT cores, the GeForce 40 series also introduces DLSS 3, a feature that at least for now is exclusive to the GeForce 40 series. Now, this new frame rate multiplying technology is super exciting stuff, and I will only very briefly show some results here, but please note our full analysis of DLSS 3 will be available a few days after this review goes live. DLSS 3 requires a significant amount of testing and analysis, which is far beyond the scope of a day one review, so please be patient as we work on that content to provide a dedicated video shortly. Now for testing, all GPUs have been tested at the official clock specification, so no factory overclocking. The CPU used was the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D with 32GB of dual rank dual channel DDR4 3200CL14 memory on the MSI MPG X570S carbon Wi-Fi motherboard, and in total I've tested 13 games at 1440p and 4K, so let's get into the data. 
Starting with Watch Dogs Legion at 1440p, the RTX 4090 doesn't look that impressive here. Sure, it's the fastest thing we've ever seen, but just a 9% boost over the 6950 XT is hardly awe inspiring. We did see a more substantial 22% uplift over the 3090 Ti, but even so, given today's GPU prices, that's not amazing. All of that said, the issue is less with the RTX 4090 here and more with the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D, which has now become the primary system bottleneck. Therefore, when increasing the resolution to 4K, we get to see just how brutally fast the RTX 4090 really is. We're now looking at a monstrous 60% boost over the 6950 XT and a 64% uplift from the 3090 Ti. That's incredible, and we are now getting a truly high refresh rate experience at 4K. It does appear though that we have a lot more CPU headroom in Rainbow Six Extraction at 1440p as here the RTX 4090 was 59% faster than the RTX 3090 Ti, while it was also 71% faster than the 3090, and 6950XT. Again, this is a seriously impressive performance uplift. Then jumping up to 4K didn't really change too much this time as we weren't CPU limited at 1440p. So the 4090 was again almost 60% faster than the 3090Ti, though the margin to the 6950XT did grow and now we're looking at a 102% deficit here for AMD. So that's extremely brutal to say the least. Now, Far Cry 6 is a better title for the Radeon brand, and at 1440p, we're pretty heavily CPU limited. So the 4090 was only able to push ahead of the 6950XT by a 9% margin, rendering 187 FPS, though the 1% lows were boosted by 13%. Again, jumping up to the 4K resolution releases the RTX 4090, resulting in incredible performance gains, averaging an impressive 164 FPS. That's a 34% uplift from the 6950XT, so not as big as some of the gains we've seen, but still very much a commanding lead. And the jump up from the RTX 3090 Ti was certainly more sizable, as here we're looking at a 50% boost and almost 60% over the standard 3090. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is another title that works well with Radeon GPUs, and the excellent support for resizable bars certainly helps the red team. As a result, at 1440p, the RTX 4090 was 27% faster than the 6950XT, which is a decent gain, but certainly far less impressive than most of the margins we've seen so far. It was also just a 37% improvement from the 3090Ti, and not the typical 60% margin seen at 4K. Speaking of which, at 4K, the 4090 rendered 116 FPS on average, making it 33% faster than the 6950XT, and 38% faster than the 3090Ti, and again, while certainly solid margins, these results are a little bit disappointing given what we've seen so far, and we're certainly not CPU limited at 4K. Hunt Showdown fans after the ultimate in performance will love what the RTX 4090 has to offer, serving up over 300 FPS at 1440p with 1% lows of over 260 FPS. That's a massive 62% increase from the 3090Ti, 67% from the standard 3090, and a 71% increase over AMD 6950XT. So the RTX 4090 is again brutally fast, even at 1440p, where we've often run into CPU limitations with the 5800X 3D. Unexpectedly though, the margins shrink at 4K, and now the 4090 is 50% faster than the 3090Ti and 62% faster than the 3090, so that's not at all what we were expecting to find. The margin to the 6950XT though remained much the same at 70%. In any case, those are some pretty big margins, and it means that those wanting to play Hunt Showdown at 4K and still receive a high refresh rate experience can do so with the RTX 4090. The Outer Worlds saw a 55% performance increase for the 4090 over the 3090Ti at 1440p, and a mega 71% increase over the 6950XT. I'm not sure you need 268 FPS in the Outer Worlds, but it's now possible using the highest quality preset at 1440p. The 4K results are probably more impressive, despite the fact that the gap to the 3090Ti has shrunk slightly to 51%, that's because we're now able to receive a truly high refresh rate experience at 4K in this title when using the RTX 4090, whereas most other GPUs struggle to hit 100 FPS. The Hitman 3 results at 1440p are quite clearly CPU limited, and no surprises here. We often use this title for CPU testing as it is very CPU demanding. When compared to the 3090Ti, we're looking at just a 7% uplift, so this will be a good configuration for testing CPUs such as Zen 4 and, of course, Intel's upcoming Raptor Lake series. 
Moving to 4K demonstrates very clearly just how CPU limited the 1440p results were, as here the RTX 4090 pulled ahead of the 3090 Ti by a massive 60% margin, while pulling a similar margin on the 6950 XT. Again, the RTX 4090 is brutally fast here. This is incredibly impressive stuff. Moving on to Horizon Zero Dawn, we again find another example of CPU bottlenecking at 1440p, and this time we're using the highest quality visual preset. So 212 FPS is the limit of the 5800X3D when running the new RTX 4090, which is a 20% increase from the 6950XT and 31% from the 3090Ti. But again, we find that the 4K resolution is required to better demonstrate the power of the RTX 4090, and here the new GeForce GPU is good for 157 FPS on average, so a 54% boost from the 3090Ti and 67% over the 6950XT. Unfortunately, I haven't had enough time to upgrade our GPU data to F122, so we'll have to stick with my recently gathered F1 2021 numbers, which are based on the maximum quality preset with the default level of ray tracing enabled. Here, the RTX 4090 pumped out 245 FPS, making it almost 60% faster than the 3090 Ti and 76% faster than the 6950 XT, so a mega result here at 1440p. Jumping up to 4K extended the margin over the 3090 Ti, as here the 4090 was seen to deliver 71% more frames and an insane 104% more than the 6950 XT, though AMD's weak RT performance will be letting down the Radeon GPU here. Still, incredible stuff, even over Nvidia's own previous generation flagship. We know that Cyberpunk 2077 is both a very CPU and GPU demanding game, but with the RTX 4090 installed, we're almost certainly CPU bound at 1440p. Here, the 4090 was good for 145 FPS on average, making it 33% faster than the 6950 XT and 36% faster than the 3090 Ti. The margins seen at 4K aren't quite as extreme as I was expecting, but still, 51% over the 3090 Ti is hardly anything to scoff at, especially given that the RTX 4090 pushed well past 60 FPS while all other GPUs fell short of that target. Next up we have Dying Light 2, and this time the 4090 was 51% faster than the 6950 XT at 1440p and a massive 68% faster than the 3090 Ti, so another incredible generational uplift there. And we see that it's much the same story at 4K, 49% faster than the 6950 XT and 58% faster than the 3090 Ti. The second last game tested is Halo Infinite, and here we're looking at fairly typical gains at 1440p, 52% faster than the RTX 3090 Ti and 60% faster than the 6950 XT. Then at 4K, those margins are extended, and now the 4090 is 72% faster than the 3090 Ti, which is an incredible performance leap. And then we see that it's also 86% faster than the 6950 XT, which as I've said before, is a brutal margin over previous generation flagships. Finally, we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and for our Zen 4 CPU testing, we found that this game was GPU limited at 1080p with the RTX 3090 Ti. Moving to the RTX 4090, we see that this is no longer going to be an issue, as this thing cranked out an insane 237 FPS at 1440p using the highest quality preset. That's a 55% boost over the 6950 XT and a 59% increase over the 3090 Ti, so more jaw-dropping results here. Speaking of jaw-dropping results, at 4K, the RTX 4090 is an incredible 70% faster than the RTX 3090 Ti and 84% faster than the 6950 XT, pumping out 160 FPS at 4K. Pretty amazing stuff, especially given that previous generation models couldn't even reach 100 FPS. Okay, so here's a look at the 13 game average, which has been calculated using the GeoMean. The RTX 4090 pumped out 219 FPS, making it on average 44% faster than the 6950 XT and 45% faster than the 3090 Ti, both of which are huge margins, but somewhat underrepresented the 4090 as the 5800X3D was limiting performance here on multiple occasions. And it's pretty crazy to think that one of the fastest gaming CPUs available today can be a serious bottleneck for the 4090 at 1440p, and in many cases we were using the highest or very high visual quality settings. I feel this is the point where technologies such as ray tracing become truly viable, and we'll look at that in a moment. But before we do, here's the 4K data, and on average, the RTX 4090 was 59% faster than the 3090 Ti and 71% faster than the 6950 XT. 
Those are some massive margins, especially given they represent the average seen across the 13 games tested. Just as impressive is the fact that the 4090 averaged 145 FPS at 4K. This is truly the first 4K GPU capable of delivering a high refresh rate gaming experience. So very impressive stuff here by NVIDIA. Now, I haven't bothered looking at the 1080p results for the 13 games tested, though I did gather all of that data. And the reason I didn't bother looking at it was because we already had a lot to go over with the 1440p and 4K data, and of course the 1080p results were often very heavily CPU limited. Still, overall the 4090 was 28% faster than the 3090 Ti at 1080p using the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D, and 24% faster than the 6950XT. So it's still very impressive here, and if anything, a great tool for testing CPU performance. Okay, time for a look at the ray tracing and upscaling results, and we'll start with F122. At 1440p, the 4090 was just 11% faster than the 3090 Ti, and 24% faster than the 6950 XT when comparing standard rasterization performance. So the ultra high quality preset, but with RTFX disabled. Then with RT plus DLSS enabled, the 4090 was just 17% faster than the 3090 Ti, or 29% faster than the 6950 XT, which was using FSR for upscaling. Then with just RT enabled, so no upscaling methods enabled, the 4090 was a massive 78% faster than the 3090 Ti, and 167% faster than the 6950 XT. So while the 6950 XT was still able to deliver playable performance with more than 60 FPS at all times, the 4090 provided a true high refresh rate experience. The 4090 also affords you the ability to enjoy maximum visual quality at 4K with ray tracing enabled. Comparing the standard rasterization results, the 4090 was 61% faster than the 3090 Ti, then a massive 86% faster with RT and DLSS enabled, and a breathtaking 91% faster with just RT and no DLSS, going from 54 FPS with the 3090 Ti to 103 FPS for the 4090. Simply amazing. And that's also more than three times the performance you'll get with the 6950 XT. Next we've got Watch Dogs Legion, and we'll start with the 1440p data, which shows a fairly small margin between the 6950XT and RTX 4090 due to a CPU bottleneck. Now this game doesn't support FSR, and therefore the 6950XT lacks upscaling support, so I've just tested two ray tracing modes. Comparing the 3090Ti and 4090 sees no difference in performance using DLSS with RT enabled. The DLSS bottleneck appears to be about 109 FPS in this title. Interestingly, the 4090 doesn't even require DLSS here as it produced the same performance with ultra quality ray traced effects enabled, making it 33% faster than the 3090Ti and 91% faster than the 6950XT. As usual though, we did get a better picture of just how powerful the 4090 is at 4K. This time using DLSS with ray tracing saw a 43% gain for the 4090 over the 3090, and then with upscaling disabled, the 4090 was 68% faster and 155% faster than the 6950 XT. Next, we have Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, and at 1440p, we find another example where DLSS does very little for the already mighty impressive RTX 4090. As a result, when comparing the ray tracing ultra quality plus DLSS results between the 3090 Ti and 4090, the new Ada Lovelace GPU was just 13% faster. However, if we ditch the upscaling, we see that the 4090 is now 47% faster. Of course, it's the 4K results where we see the biggest margins, and this time DLSS is of benefit for the 4090, pushing it ahead of the 3090 Ti by a 54% margin, and then 131% faster than the 6950XT using FSR. Then with no upscaling, but with RT Ultra enabled, the 4090 was 58% faster than the 3090 Ti and 88% faster than the 6950XT. Now the ray tracing performance in Dying Light 2 is quite brutal, especially without the aid of DLSS. For example, at 1440p, the 3090 Ti is only good for 52 FPS on average, though that performance can be bumped up to 86 FPS using DLSS quality mode. Still, that means using DLSS with RT enabled, the 4090 was 98% faster than the 3090 Ti, and an insane 117% faster without the aid of upscaling. The 4K data is just as impressive. I'm not exactly sure why, but the 3090 Ti does quite poorly using the ray tracing quality preset in Dying Light 2, but with the RT settings turned off. So what should be just standard rasterization performance using DirectX 12 sees the 4090 delivering 122% greater performance. So again, 
I'm not sure why that is. Even with DLSS enabled, the 4090 was still 110% faster and then 115% faster with the upscaling disabled. Now the last game we're going to look at ray tracing and DLSS performance with is Cyberpunk 2077. At 1440p the RTX 4090 with RTFX disabled was 36% faster than the 3090 Ti and that margin is again seen with RT Ultra plus DLSS quality enabled. But it does blow out to a massive 69% margin when using RT without DLSS as here the 4090 was still good for 86 FPS. Then at 4K, the RTX 4090 crushes the RTX 3090 Ti, delivering 72% greater performance with RT and DLSS enabled, and then 80% with just ray tracing enabled, though we're only looking at 45 FPS on average here. Lastly, here's a look at DLSS 3 performance, and please note we will have a detailed analysis of this technology in a dedicated video shortly. Now, at 1440p using the higher quality preset, the RTX 4090 was good for 145 FPS on average in Cyberpunk 2077 making it around 35% faster than both the 3090 Ti and 6950 XT. However, with DLSS 3 enabled, performance appears to have been boosted by 90% to 276 FPS. And with limited testing, the game did feel smooth. But of course, I'm very keen to see what Tim digs up in his detailed testing. Now, the real advantage of DLSS 3 can be seen with ultra quality ray tracing enabled, as here, the 4090 was good for 191 FPS on average, making it almost 70% faster than DLSS 2. And of course, the real advantage can be seen at 4K, where the 4090 pumped out 113 FPS using DLSS 3 in conjunction with Ultra RTFX, a 43% boost over DLSS 2. Incredible stuff, and again, with my limited testing, the game did look good, it felt very smooth, but putting these numbers into context will be Tim's detailed analysis, which again will be available in a few days from now. Okay, so here's a look at total system power consumption when playing Halo at 1440p. And as you can see, the RTX 4090 actually isn't bad. In fact, it's very good delivering 50% more performance than the RTX 3090 Ti while using less power. Now, both the 4090 and 3090 Ti are 450 watt graphics cards, so technically they should consume about the same amount of power. But the reason the 3090 Ti can be seen pushing total system usage about 50 watts higher is because there's no founders edition model of the 3090 Ti, and instead we're using an MSI card which uses above spec voltage. So although I have clocked it down to the official NVIDIA specification, which shaves a few percent off in terms of performance, the higher voltage means power consumption is still higher than what it would be for a base model. Anyway, the point is, the RTX 4090 is a 450 watt product, so power consumption isn't anything we haven't seen before from flagship graphics cards. Here's a look at just how power efficient the RTX 4090 is. By locking the frame rate at 90 FPS, we can see how much power each GPU uses, and I'll be comparing the 4090 with the 3090 Ti and 6950 XT. At this locked frame rate, the 4090 consumed just 215 watts, and that means for the same level of performance, the 3090 Ti required 93% more power, and the 6950 XT 40% more power. So despite all the talk of the 4090 being just this outrageous, out of control beast, it's actually extremely impressive when it comes to power efficiency. Now, when it comes to cooling performance, the Founders Edition RTX 4090 peaked at 83 degrees for the hotspot after an hour of load in a 21 degree room installed inside an ATX case with the doors closed. The average GPU temperature peaked at 72 degrees and the memory temperature peaked at 84 degrees, so all of those temperatures are very acceptable, especially given the low operating volume. With a fan speed of just 1600 RPM, the operating volume was just 42 decibels, which is quieter than most high-end and even mid-range graphics cards that I've tested in the past. And during this testing, the core clock speed held pretty steady at 2730 MHz, and of course the memory ran at 21 gigabits per second. And finally, the GPU power draw averaged 415 watts. Now, via overclocking, I was able to push the Founders Edition cores up to 2895 MHz, so a fairly typical 6% boost there, and the memory hit 24.5 gigabits per second. This increased the GPU power to 470 watts on average, which is a 13% increase, though the fan speed didn't really increase, but the hotspot temperature did climb to 86 degrees, so a 5% increase there, and the memory also jumped up by 4 degrees. When it comes to performance figures, we're looking at a fairly mild 7% boost in Hitman, taking the RTX 4090 from 182 FPS to 194 FPS. And it's a similar story in Watch Dogs Legion, where the overclocked 4090 was 6% faster, going from 141 FPS to 150 FPS, 
and we also saw a 6% boost in Cyberpunk 2077. So nothing crazy there, but as you'd expect from a product like the 4090, it's pushed pretty hard out of the box. Okay, time for the cost per frame analysis, and I'll start with the 1440p data using the suggested retail pricing for each model. Based on the MSRP, the 4090 looks very good, even when using the more CPU limited 1440p data. In terms of cost per frame, it's roughly on par with the 6950XT and 6900XT, but crucially, it is over 30% more costly than what we believed were the sensible previous generation high end options in the RTX 3080 and 6800 XT. Actually, it's more like 50% more expensive when compared to the 6800 XT. Still, when compared to what I call the dumb options like the RTX 3080 Ti, 3090, and 3090 Ti, even at 1440p, the 4090 is comparatively good value. The 4K data using the MSRP is even more favorable. And here the 4090 appears far better value than the 6950XT and 6900XT, offering around 15% greater value. Still, it is 16% more costly per frame when compared to the RTX 3080 and 21% more costly than the 6800XT. Still, it does have 24 gigabytes of VRAM, so when compared to the 3090, we're looking at significantly better value with a saving of 38% per frame. Now looking beyond MSRPs and instead focusing on current real world pricing, the RTX 4090 is a lot less attractive. Using the 1440p data, we see that it's actually slightly worse than the 3090 Ti in terms of value, making it the most expensive GPU on the market today in terms of cost per frame and overall price. The 4K data though better represents the RTX 4090, but even here we see that at $1,600, it is slightly more costly than the 6950XT, though also slightly better than the heavily discounted RTX 3090. So I guess that's pretty good for a stupid high-end class type product, let's say. That said, you're looking at a 21% premium in terms of price to performance over the RTX 3080, which frankly isn't good. Still, we're comparing a brand new product to a two-year-old GPU that's now selling below MSRP. So while a valid comparison for those of you looking to buy right now, older discounted products are almost always going to represent better value. So what to make of the GeForce RTX 4090? Well, it's obviously very fast. It's brutally fast, in fact, as I've said a number of times now, but I don't think performance was ever really the issue here. I think the key concerns people seem to have with the 4090 was the price and power consumption. Now, the price is obviously understandable and it is a real issue, but the power consumption, I think it's clear now that the rumors of just absolutely insane power consumption were wrong, that the 4090 isn't absurd in that sense, using slightly less power than the 3090 Ti in our testing. So while still a very hungry GPU, it's nothing we haven't seen before from flagship products. And given the exceptionally high performance, the performance per what you're getting with the RTX 4090 is incredibly good. We also saw when capped to the same frame rate in Cyberpunk 2077, that the 4090 consumed almost 50% less power than the 3090T and almost 30% less than the 6950XT. And this then leaves the issue of the price. And that's not an easy one to get around. Based on the 4K data using MSRPs, we saw that the 4090 is 16% more costly per frame than the 3080, which actually isn't that far off the margin seen previously when comparing the 3090 and 2080. And although I didn't have time to include the 2080 data here, the 3090 upon release was 13% more costly per frame than the 2080. So that means the 4090 is pretty similar in terms of value to that of the 3090, which wasn't a good value product because the 3080 was just 13% slower on average while costing 53% less. So when looking strictly at ultra high-end GPU pricing, the 4090, it isn't terrible. And I guess for people with deep pockets who buy these products, that's a win. Of course, what made Ampere great in my eyes was the RTX 3080. And although the crypto boom did spoil it, for a moment, it was pretty great. So the hope is the RTX 4080, at least one of them, represents great value. And that's something we'll explore at a later date. My point is though, until more Ada Lovelace GPUs arrive, and of course AMD's RDNA 3 GPUs, it is hard to say just how good, dumb, or bad value the RTX 4090 is for this new generation. Not only that, but I can sit here all day and complain about the $1,600 US asking price, but it ultimately will change nothing, accomplishes very little, and won't discourage those who plan on buying an RTX 4090 from doing so. There is clearly a market for these extreme high-end GPUs, and if enough people are willing to part with $1,600 US or more for an RTX 4090, then this segment will continue to exist, and nothing I say will change that.
So moving past the cost per frame or any kind of value analysis to just look at the RTX 4090 for what it is, a brutally fast GPU, how excited should high-end gamers be? Again, ignoring the price, I am very excited about the RTX 4090. It's the first time I've enjoyed a truly high refresh rate gaming experience at 4K without having to compromise on visuals. Ray tracing is finally a carefree option, and while DLSS is still important here, enjoying games such as Dying Light 2, Cyberpunk 2077, and Watch Dogs Legion at 4K with ultra quality ray tracing enabled, while frame rates stayed above 60 FPS, it's a special experience. DLSS 3 is obviously a very exciting new feature, but as I've said, more investigation will be required here before I can comment on just how much of a selling point it is, and we'll have more information on that shortly. So in short, the gaming experience with the GeForce RTX 4090 Founders Edition was breathtaking and surprisingly practical as well. I was able to run it just fine using my old Corsair RM850X 850W power supply using the included adapter. The Founders Edition model running under full load for extended periods of time is very quiet, no louder than a quality mid-range graphics card, and as I've said, power consumption wasn't outrageous. Less than that of custom 3090 Ti's that I have, and again, my 850 watt power supply doesn't look as though its life's gonna be cut short. Now, I know Nvidia made several bold claims when announcing the new GeForce 40 series, but I really don't care to delve into that here. Companies saying dumb stuff has become the norm. In fact, it's pretty much always been this way. You can argue AMD doesn't misrepresent their products nearly as much as Nvidia, and maybe that's true. I really don't care to get into that debate here. They're both guilty of stretching the truth or at the very least focusing on extreme outliers or highly unrealistic test conditions. And that's kind of their job, I suppose. At this point, you have to get over it and accept that that's just what they do. That said, I'm all for stamping out really anti-consumer behavior, such as commissioning or paying for third-party benchmarks, something both Nvidia and Intel do and have done quite a bit of. As for the RTX 4090, there's really not much more to say at this point in time. Personally, I'd never pay $1,600 US for a graphics card because as good as it is, Gaming's just not worth that kind of investment to me. And I suppose more to the point, I can enjoy gaming almost as much with a GPU that costs at least four times less. So I still feel we're firmly into dumb GPU pricing territory here. But like I said, how dumb depends on the price to performance offered by the RTX 4080 models and of course AMD's upcoming RDNA 3 series. So rather than rush out and buy a 4090, I just wait to see what AMD has to offer and it won't be too long now till we get a look at AMD's RDNA GPUs. And really from what I'm hearing, you really shouldn't have too much trouble buying a 4090 anyway, uh, should you decide to go that way. I've heard that stock is apparently very plentiful. And with that, I'm gonna end this review here. Very impressive stuff again, but yeah, keen to see what else we end up getting. So make sure you are subscribed for that. If you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. And if you'd like to become a Harbour Box community member, then we do have Floatplane and Patreon. You can sign up to either one of those things. That'll get you access to behind the scenes content, a monthly live stream with Tim and myself and our exclusive Discord server, along with a few other cool perks. So yeah, if you're interested, check that out. But if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.